All right, thank you very much for coming. Uh, my name is Stanislav. This is the topic I'm going to present. In hindsight, I should have called it making IoT not so great again, <laughs> but I didn't know the, what would be the previous presentation. So a little bit about me. I uh, started my master's and I finished my master's in industrial automation and control systems. So I'm one of those people who somehow contributed to the mess we have with the critical infrastructure by being an embedded software developer. To redeem myself, I started uh, doing PhD in computer science, um, but the topic was mostly about vulnerability management, SBOMs, and open source software. So a little bit different. And currently, I'm a security researcher at Forscout Technologies in the Netherlands, and uh, I particularly enjoy uh, analyzing implementations of network protocols. And doing so, I got over 100 CVs, and I even contributed with one RFC to the community. Uh, lastly, the following work is uh, I work together with my colleague Francesco Laspina, and all the errors and mistakes I make during presentations are mine and mine alone. Right, so why did I decide to make this talk? And uh, this is the, the recurrent topic I see all the time during my work, and um, there has been plenty of buffer overflows found uh, during, uh, since the initial publication of Smashing the Stack article, and you would think that people already know how these things are working and how to prevent them. Uh, also, nowadays it is much harder to exploit buffer overflows because of all the binary protection mechanisms, awareness, virtualization, and other things. And when uh, looking at forums, I found this beautiful citation which says that stack smashing is a dying art form as things move away from uh, bare metal into virtualized environment. I find this one uh, particularly funny. <laughs> Um, so today we will see that stack smashing is as relevant as ever, especially for IoT and networking. And I will show a couple of devices that we found vulnerable and we successfully exploited. And just yesterday there was a presentation about edge devices, but more from a defender perspective, I will offer you a different one, the perspective of the attacker. So in the left corner we have um, an Airlink L60 wireless gateway, uh, which is manufactured by Sierra Wireless. This is a Canadian manufacturer of networking equipment. And if you are a consumer, you probably have never heard of those. But if you do not network security or system administration, you have probably seen one. Um, they are quite popular in this area. And uh, you can still find lots of them exposed online. I think last time I checked was about half a year ago, it was close to 80,000. And uh, yeah, they are used in uh, many critical areas, including critical infrastructure, vehicles, uh, oil and gas fields, remote healthcare facilities. And basically, it's, uh, it looks like a Raspberry Pi. Uh, with, a, with a SIM slot and usually used in the environments when you don't have traditional networks. Uh, they, uh, inside the box, they run, run some kind of uh, Linux distribution and the underlying architecture is ARM32. And uh, what I found interesting about this one is that they don't allow you to have root shell. So you cannot really troubleshoot device or change anything about it. You have to call the technical support to do it. That's also an interesting story, but I will tell it maybe another time. Uh, what I forgot to tell, tell about this one is that they uh, had some critical vulnerabilities some years ago, and they were targeted by botnets who took over these devices to do some stuff. In the right corner, we have a Vigor series of devices manufactured by Drytech, and this time this is a Taiwanese manufacturer. Uh, this device is much bigger, so it's uh, designed to be fit into a server rack, and it actually is a mini server because it has a four CPU core, uh, it has about eight gigs of RAM, and quite a large SSD, so it's pretty powerful. And this is again a device that sits on the edge of the, the networks and organizations, so it's basically your VPN slash gateway slash security appliance, so it's pretty advanced. 
Uh, the interesting aspect about this one is that uh, they run the same operating system across the board, but in this one it is being virtualized. So you have uh, uh, Ubuntu Linux, which is a host, and it basically runs the router operating system as a guest, which is a pretty interesting design decision. Like the previous one, it doesn't allow you any root access, let alone access to the host operating system. So. I'm not sure even technical support can do that for you. Uh, and basically, yeah, uh, I think this month I checked there was more than 700,000 of these exposed in line, which is not a good sign. And uh, lately there has been a report about uh, allegedly Chinese threat actors targeting this one, uh, this, this uh, line of model specifically, probably because of, yeah, of their headquarters. Because if you look at the distribution of devices, they have quite a bit in Taiwan, uh, Netherlands, and United Kingdom. And when we dig deeper, we realize that most of them are actually ISPs. So as a customer, you might receive not this particular device, but one of the family. Right, so straight to it. How do we defeat the LX60 with the common buffer overflows? Uh, so in this particular case, there was a stack slash heap based buffer overflow in OpenNDS. Uh, OpenNDS, uh, I believe it stands for Open Network Demarcation Service. In this particular device, it has been used as a captive portal. So it's an open source project that appears to be not known by many people, but it's again everywhere. And for those of you who don't know what are captive portals, this is basically the internet you use here at the hotel. So you connect to the public network, you get a pop-up which tells you to uh, accept some terms of services or enter your uh, email, and then after you do so, it disappears and you get access to the internet. So that's how captive portals work in a nutshell. Yeah, and the problem here was uh, basically you can actually request, do requests uh, to, to this captive portal where you connect to the Wi-Fi, and you can specify an arbitrary query string. And in this case, they didn't check the length of the query string, which is marked in red on this picture. And if you provide a sufficiently long query string, it crashes. So that's <laughs> that's pretty trivial one. Now, how do we get to exploit this? Um, so uh, I, I did a little bit uh, trial and error with the, uh, with the project itself, and I also tried to virtualize uh, the binary itself that I extracted from the firmware, and I got some success, but the problem with this device is that I didn't have any debugger or any other ways to, uh, to poke into memory, so it was not so easy to do. So when I started to investigate, I realized that uh, immediately the heap and the stack are not executable, so I cannot inject any shell code directly and I have to be to, to use uh, return-oriented programming of some kind. Moreover, they have uh, enabled other space layout randomization, which means uh, when the binary loads into memory, the, the location of the heap, the stack, and the, bi uh, the libraries will be at seemingly random uh, place, so I cannot reliably do stuff with the buffer overflow. And while Looking at the function that was initially vulnerable, I found that it didn't actually work as it's supposed to do. So it didn't parse the query string correctly. And because of these things, and because they actually use string length to calculate the size of the copy, I realized that the, whatever shellcode or prop chain I injected will be slashed at the end of the string when I encounter zero. So I didn't have much of the room to do stuff. And as I mentioned, they didn't have a debugger to, to figure all these things out and uh, realize the workaround. On the flip side of things, I realized that the, it's not a positional independent executable, which means uh, that the addresses of functions are not randomized, so at least I can rel uh, reliably jump to various places within the binary, and that's a good thing. And while looking at the source code of OpenNDS, I found this very nice function that is called execute thread and it's used for different kinds of housekeeping. For example, uh, under the hood in my code IP tables to do some network demarcation and all this kind of stuff. And of course, of course, the interface of the function is for executing OS commands, which looks very promising. 
But uh, so I, I thought initially maybe if I can call somehow this thing function with the arbitrary parameters, I can pop a root shell or something. But in order to do that, I needed to understand how to pass parameters to this function. And to do that, usually you need to be able to leak some kind of memory. And normally this is achieved by either the same vulnerability if you have some stuck trace or debug lock or whatever, or you have to find another one. In this particular case, I was very lucky because I didn't have to do neither of these things. Uh, within the binary itself, there was a function called debug, and it accepts several parameters, the first of which is the debug level, which has to be an integer value between 0 and 7. I think it's different kind of log verbosity. I'm not sure, but most likely. And the funny fact is that if you specify a value that doesn't fall into these boundaries, it gives you a message saying that the debug level is unsupported, and then it prints the value that you provided into the log itself. And on the device, there is, uh, when you log into the web interface, there is a debug log, and basically every service, every binary out there just pipes the output into this log. So in this way, when I was using this buffer overflow to just blindly jump to this function, as you can see, it gave me a pretty big integer, which uh, if you convert it to a hex, uh, that looks like a heap address. And uh, basically, yeah, by, by removing <coughs> some bits, you realize that this is the base address of the heap in this case. And of course, they're using ASLR, but as I read in some manuals on ARM32 systems, ASLR is pretty limited. So in this particular case, reali realistically, you only get two different base addresses. And I did some experiments, and this first ba base address that you can see here happens in about 66% of cases. So statistics was on my side. So basically, most of the time I run the exploit, and I choose this base address, my exploit will be executed. Worst case, I get it in our service, it crashes, but then the watchdog will restart it in a few seconds. So that's, that's pretty good. <clears throat> so finally, how I decided to exploit this one. Uh, here on, on the top, you see the screenshot from the debugger, and basically when the, the function and processes the query string exits, it's the classical uh, instruction that normally it's a calling convention on ARM. Basically, you pop, you restore values of some registers, and in this particular one, I pop a number of registers from the stack, and basically, when I do the buffer overflow here, I control all the values uh, that will be placed into the register from R4 until R11. And then the program counter would be the return address, which I also control. Uh, so because I could not really inject a re reliable source code, but uh, sorry, reliable shell code, but I could reliably jump, and I knew where some of the get requests objects are located on the heap, I could come up with this thing. So first I found this uh, very nice gadget which basically takes uh, whatever value I place into the R register R4, and then it puts it into the register R2, which is commonly used as the first argument to the function. <clears throat> and then it just calls this execute red function directly. So this is basically all I need to, to do my stuff. And the final exploit for this one will look like this. So in place of the URL, you just put a string, which is the OS command you would like to execute. Then in place of the query string, you add some padding bytes, which can be anything except zero. And uh, basically this, you, you'll have to pad it until you reach the address of the URL, which is the address of the OS command that you place in place of URL, and that will be this heap address. Then you add some more padding, and lastly you just have to specify the address of this gadget that you see at the bottom. So uh, the address of the URL here is marked in green, and the gadget is in red, and the address here is different because this is my debugger, and this is not the actual device. Uh, but this is how it works in the device itself. I hope you can see that. So basically, I'm connected to Wi-Fi. I just make one GET request. And now I'm able to distribute all of you some malware through, through the Wi-Fi or do whatever I want. So that's, that's pretty easy to do. 
Right, uh, now to something completely different, which is not so different if you look closer. Sorry, in Dry, dry Tech Vigor devices, there is a web UI, uh, which is the only thing apart from a uh, telnet daemon that you can use to configure the device. And it has a similar problem of not parsing the query string correctly. However, this time it happens uh, in such a way that I cannot overwrite the query string directly, I can overwrite it indirectly. So on the right you can see a very schematic depiction of how the stack will look like. And basically what happens is that you can have uh, multiple key value pairs in the query string. And uh, for, in for, for each key and value, it will allocate some space in the heap, and then we'll put the address of this heap uh, of these heap buffers on the stack. So basically, if you provide enough uh, query string pairs, it will essentially reach the return address and further until yeah you want to stop. So in this way, they never check if there are too many pairs. Uh, basically, they copy these addresses on the static uh, on the statically allocated buffer on the stack, and then basically, if, yeah, if you put too many of them, you can override this. Uh, one interesting thing about this virtualized uh, route arrays is that it's ARM64 bytecode, but it's run in 32-bit mode, which means that all the functions and pointers and integers are 32-bit, not 64. So it was a little bit peculiar. Uh, how do we trigger these things, and how do we easily exploit that? So the web UI consisted of about 40 different CGI pages, which are basically callback functions. So each CGI page has its own stack layout, its own variables, but all of them were processing the query string. So technically, to trigger the bug, to do the denial of service, you just call any of these function, uh, functions or pages on the web server with a long enough query string, and that's it. The problem here is that because it's uh, Kimu, uh, and the, the host actually monitors the state of the guest, it gets restarted in like a couple of seconds. So you don't even notice the effect of the denial of service, and we have to do better than that. Uh, on the flip side, there's no data execution prevention, so the shell code can be executed directly. Uh, it's not a positional independent executable, so you know where to jump. And there's no SLR, so you, you don't have to guess many of the things. But uh, when I looked closer at the implementation, there were some challenges which I still had to overcome. And one of these challenges is the fact that most of these, at first I thought all of these CGI pages require authentication before they start to process the query string. So at least you need to know the password to do so. And the second one, when you actually about to exit the CGI function where you are about to jump to, to your a uh, spoofed address, this function is called, which basically frees all the pointers from the heap allocated for the query string. Incidentally, it only frees the keys, but leaves the values. Probably they just didn't know, didn't know how 32-bit more than 64 works. Uh, the worst of all, it also zeroes out the addresses that it places on the stack. So if you manage to overwrite the return address with one of these, in the end, it will just write it to zero, and all the all the best th things you get is sec fault, which results in a very min a minor denial of service. And uh, this is an example where, yeah, the vulnerabilities that in theory have a very large severity in practice cannot be exploited. But I like when I buy devices to truly own them, so I spend a little bit more time. And one of the pages actually didn't require authentication for processing query strings. And this is because if you copy paste a lot of code, here and there, you sometimes just misplace it. <laughs> and finally, there was, in this function, there was a very lucky local variable that was initialized to zero just before uh, the return address on the stack. So in this way, that function that frees the whole thing because it work, works in the chain and only stops when it sees the zero address. It will see that local variable as zero and stop there, and my return address will remain intact. So it was a very lucky chain of consequences. So how do you exploit these things knowing all this? 
is extremely simple. All you need to do is basically call, uh, do a GET request on this uh, vulnerable web page. You have to find it first, but still. Then you add a bunch of ampersand characters as padding. So here you, you, you must add only keys uh, and don't specify any values because the value you are using uh, the higher four bytes of address. And because the addresses are only 32 bits, you cannot return to the 64-bit address. Uh, so that, that, that's one thing. But it's okay, you just don't have to specify it. And then you place a very simple show code snippet. You can just write anything you want here, honestly. But I choose just to, to write a simple show code that just gets the address of the message that follows the show codes. Basically, it's an arbitrary string that I can pass into the program. Then uh, injects the, basically initially gets the address of printf. Uh, then because we are ethical security testers, we don't want to crash the system. So I had to restore the previous control flow. And then I just call printf. And the effect of this will be that I can troll system administrators and they will see some funny stuff in the log, but the device will not crash. There will be nothing else in the logs. So uh, you see there is a lot of devices exposed online. Most of them are using default passwords. So I decided I can do a little bit better than this and help out system administrators and change all the passwords for these devices at once. So here you can see me running this on the 3910. I'm logging in using the default password. That's a bad thing. Probably the sysadmin doesn't know they can't be hacked. So it's a little bit slow. Bear with me. This is just to show you that, yeah, the password is being the default one. So we, we are logged in. It will even tell you that, oh, hey, you're using the default password. This is bad. But they didn't listen. So I'm just using this tool to help them out now and to change the password for them so that they, they cannot be hacked. And as you will see now, there will be no complaints about the default password because we just changed it for them. But uh, on the serious note, the way it works is because all the settings you can set through the web UI or through Telnet, everything, including the password, they are stored in the flash memory. And on boot, they are basically stored in the BSS in clear text format. So all I need to do with my exploit is just overwrite that string with whatever I want, and that will be the new password. If I want to make it persistent, I will just log in to the telnet over SSH with the same new password and make it permanent. Uh, this is also possible because they use the same password across the entire OS, including the host operating system, which is very nice. Uh, but as I told you, the, the remote shell, unfortunately, is not possible because this is a virtual machine, and uh, there was no way to do that. But this will not go well. This will not stand. So here's the bonus level. Because the host OS has to control the guest somehow, especially when it crashes or something happens to it or you need to update firmware, um, there is a virtual interface, a virtual serial interface between the host and the guest. And then the guest can request commands to be executed by the host on the guest. And there's a white list of these commands. You can see it on top of the slides. They include reboot, firmware upload, and some others. And only these commands are allowed. So now I would like to check if you are awake. And those of you who see the problem here, please raise a hand. You don't have to answer. You just can guess, and then I will show you if you are right or not. CTF players, huh? 
Okay, so the problem here is that uh, the input is not sanitized. So I can add, for example, a set Linux IP or set Linux time comment, and then I can just pipe whatever else I like. So in this way, by using the same bug and just changing the shell code pattern that I showed you slightly, we can just get a root shell by exploiting a buffer overflow on a host. Sorry, on a guest, we can get the root shell on a host. And then from here, the possibilities are limitless and the world is your oyster, as they say. And now I'm executing several commands because I'm just, this is my device and plugging with the networking cable and I have to set the IP address first. And yeah, that's it. Then you can basically install whatever you want. I wanted to play Doom on this, but I didn't have enough time to prepare, maybe for the next time. That's all I had to say. Thank you very much, and uh, please ask your questions. Ask your questions. There's one. Uh, did you have a chance to break in into a hotel network? Are you asking for a friend? <laughs> kind of. <laughs> no. <laughs> Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. It was a nice one. Um, I was interested in your debug setup. Um, I'm not sure if the software is open source or how you get to debug the, the binaries. So it's, there's no sub setup whatsoever. You just uh, dump the firmware. So the firmware is encrypted. You have to figure out how to decrypt it. But then it's just individual binaries that you can emulate with uh, ARM DBG. And then this is just GDB. Okay. This and is pure mm -hmm. GDB with no plugins. To get the, the, the firmware of the device, you use like UART or JTAG interfaces. So there is so both devices come with the encrypted firmware, but the problem is that there are other researchers that look at it and they never change the encryption keys. So the, for the second device, it was a bit different. I showed you the exploits on two different devices, 3910 and 3912. For the first one, we, we were able to find the write-up, and my colleague has created a script to decrypt it. For the second one, they have changed something, so we couldn't do it. So I had to use the buffer overflow just to be able to connect my hard drive and dump the firmware and dump the file that is used to decrypt the firmware. I don't understand how it works, but I don't need to because I have the decryptor now. <laughs> Thanks. Good job. I don't see anything else. Thank you very much. Thank you.